I've covered some aeronautical sites on the channel before and I'll leave a playlist at the end and below if you want to check some of those videos out. And today we're going to be looking at something else aeronautical slash radio related and that is RAF Burtonwood. Now the history of RAF Burtonwood is well documented out there on the internet so of course in true Ringway Manchester style we're going to look at the most obscure nerdy part and that is the radio side of things. Before I carry on, you're going to see a lot of the Burtonwood Heritage Centre in this video and it's a really amazing place with so much to see. I spoke to one of the volunteers there who said they're always looking for extra volunteers as well as somebody who can repair vintage radio equipment. He also told me that a local radio club used to meet here too. If you feel you could help, especially on the radio repair side of things, then the link to the museum is in the description below. Either way, if you're in the area, make sure you visit this amazing little museum, as you won't be disappointed. So, I traced the entire history of the old British Aerospace Woodford Airfield across two videos last year, and you seem to enjoy it. There was actually still loads left to look at, despite the airfield being virtually all redeveloped. RAF Burtonwood has been completely redeveloped and from a radio point of view there really is nothing left to see but I'll tell you the story as best as I can including all of the known frequencies the site used over the years for air traffic control and beacons. The airfield was a Royal Air Force and United States Army Air Force base that was located in the town of Burtonwood two miles northwest of Warrington in Cheshire. The base opened in 1940 as part of the World War II effort by the RAF and in 1942 it was transferred to the United States of America for war operations. The base was home to 18,000 American servicemen at the end of the war and was one of the largest United States military bases in Europe. In 1946 it was transferred back to the United Kingdom, however the US Army's operations still continued there. They developed Burtonwood into a storage and forward supply depot operated by the 47th Support Group, the concept being that in the event of an emergency, US troops in the USA that were earmarked for NATO service in Europe would fly over and pick up their kit from Burtonwood before going to the front line. However, in 1993 it closed completely, but let's go back to the 1940s. There was a radio repair workshop on the site for many years under numerous guises. The original repair workshop was on the ground floor of the old World War II control tower while the VHF radio equipment itself was on the second floor. The control tower also had transmitters and receivers located on the floor directly under the tower's operating floor. There was modern telephone communication to the tower which replaced a hand crank telephone system which previously served as a direct line to the tower. Later, Burtonwood had a much larger radio workshop that overhauled many varieties of air and ground-based radios as well as their supporting equipment. January 1953 saw the start of construction of a huge new warehouse on Site 8. This was located on the west side of Burtonwood Road and immediately north of the Liverpool to Manchester railway line with a siding being taken from the line for rail transport. On August 16th 1954 the warehouse was opened and became known as Hedder House. It was the largest covered warehouse in Europe at the time with a length of 5,280 feet or 1 mile as well as a width of 1,255 feet with a capacity of 5 million cubic feet. The building housed a strong room which was home to radio equipment. The equipment rack survived until the early 2000s, albeit empty, and the room housed the US Army HF radio station. Also surviving into the early 2000s was a coax feed that once connected the transmitters and receivers to a HF Yagi antenna that was located behind Header House. Radio was huge on the airfield with 13,346 radios and radar systems installed in aircraft. There was also 126,684 modifications to existing radio systems and the manufacture of 32,232 radio kits or units at the workshop itself. In the mid to late 1950s, available services at Burtonwood were Approach UHF, Tower VHF, UHF and HF, Raycon, Range and GCA and ILS. 
So let's look at a couple of these terms that you may not be as familiar with. Raycon is basically a transmitter receiver relating to a fixed navigational mark which when triggered by an aircraft's radar automatically returns a signal which appears on the display of the triggering radar providing range, bearing and identification information. This was used as one of a few means of guiding pilots into Burtonwood. There was also GCA or ground control approach. For the most part a GCA uses information from either a precision approach radar or airport surveillance radar. PAR is used for precision approaches with vertical glide path guidance and ASR provides a non-precision surveillance radar approach with no glide path guidance. Another term we used was range. This came about much earlier as a more adequate replacement for what were known as beams. So, in simple terms, beams were radio beacons broadcasting a simple Morse code signal that could be honed in on using direction finding antennas. But these were of limited usefulness and required pilots to have DF equipment and know how to use it correctly. I actually covered this in my video on RNAS Stretton which isn't far away and the original tower still stands to this day. Instead of beams, Burton would broadcast a set of signals that ensured reception and guidance from any location around the radio station. Because the entire range around the station was affected, these stations became known as radio ranges. The system used LF and MF frequencies between 200 and 410 kHz. The radio range transmitters and their antennas were arranged so they projected four beams, each with a constant tone, audible on the radio when the pilot was on course. The beams were typically about 3 to 4 degrees wide. When the aircraft was off course to one side or another, different sounds would be heard. Pilots would tune their radio to the frequency of the desired radio range and confirm that they had the right one tuned in by listening for an intermittent identifier signal, typically three letters broadcast in Morse code, often resembling an abbreviation of the name of the nearest town or airport. Once correctly tuned in, the pilots listened to the continuous signal from the station, which would be Morse code for the letter A or N, depending on which quadrant he was flying in, or a constant hum resulting from the overlapping A and N signals along a beam between two quadrants. Typically, the goal was to be on the beam, following the centerline of an airway. If the signal of a single letter, A or N, became audibly distinct, the aircraft would be turned as required so that the modulation of the two letters would overlap again, and the Morse code audio would become a steady hum. When the aircraft was over the station, the audio signal disappeared, since there was no modulation signal directly above the transmitting towers. This quiet zone, often called the cone of silence, signified to the pilots that the aircraft was directly overhead the station, serving as a positive ground reference point for the approach procedure. Major use of Burton Wood ended in April 1959 when the flight line was closed, although some use of the runway was made by gliders at the RAF Air Training Corps. Military traffic at Burton Wood naturally decreased dramatically after this time, with the exception of the occasional use as a V-bomber dispersal base. An operational readiness platform was built for this at the end of runway 27. Temporary air traffic and launch control would be established for up to a week, subject to the length of the specific exercise, but the frequencies are unknown. For much of its post-war existence, any Burtonwood approaches were controlled by the Manchester Control Zone, a service set up to accommodate the vast amount of air traffic in the area. I did make a video on this topic as well, which I'll link below and at the end of this one. Usable runway length in 1962 was 9,000 feet, but this reduced to 4,200 by 1969 due to the reopening of a road crossing the runway as well as apparent mining subsidence. By June 1969, Burton Wood used an advisory service only on 121.5, 122.1 and 141.3. One of the last users of the Burtonwood site was 635 Gliding School of the Air Cadets which formed at Burtonwood on the 26th of October 1959. They stayed until the 1st of April 1984 when they moved to the British Aerospace site at Salmsbury in Lancashire. 
They operated at weekends when flying activity at Burtonwood was stopped, and once the airfield was closed to military traffic, week-long courses became the only activity there and were sometimes held in the summer. One of the last known aviation-related uses for Burtonwood was listed in various sources as just helicopters. What they were and who they were used by I can't be certain, but they were likely US Army and were logged well into the 1980s using a frequency of 119.85. This is an approach frequency for Liverpool Airport, which ties into the fact that there was no air traffic control at Burtonwood. There was, however, a helipad. In the 1970s and 1980s, the area was used extensively by the Territorial Army and Cadet Units for training purposes. The site was also used by the MOD for civil contingency and emergency planning exercises, as well as EOD exercises for police, fire and rescue training. The US Army pulled out of Burtonwood at the end of the First Gulf War in 1991, despite its part in the conflict, and in 1993 it was declared surplus to both the US and NATO requirements, and closed. Today there's virtually nothing that serves as an immediate clue to the site's former use, which is remarkable considering its size. It was at one time the largest American military base in Europe, and even by today's standards it fares well. The site was actually bigger in terms of acres than RAF Milden Hall in Suffolk. As for the thousands upon thousands of radio transmissions that took place there, well, they fizzled away into the ether many decades ago, never to return. <laughs>